as the title here says, this is a uh, presentation about a couple of projects which STM is deeply involved in, which are, amongst other things, aimed to help the publishing community increase the impact of, of um, uh, research in a couple of, I hesitate to say markets, but certainly a couple of communities, the developing world and indeed amongst patient communities. I would add another rider. Um, we have during the course of this morning heard a lot about ways of, of measuring uh, and analysing impact in terms of citations and downloads and blogs and tweets. Most of what I'm going to say uh, in the next 25 minutes uh, is really a bit downstream of that. So there won't be a lot of emphasis on the uh, metrics that we've uh, talked about so far. We're taking it, I think, one step further. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, a, as, as I say, is a couple of these um, initiatives that uh, STM has been involved in. In the developing world, the uh, Research for Life initiative, which has been going now for about 15 years, and Patient Inform for, for uh, patients and carers, which has been going on, I think, for about the same amount of time, although I'm a little bit less certain of that. So if we start with um, Research for Life, the goal of that, it's a, a collaborative public-private partnership uh, quite unusual in a way, I think, uh, in the sense that it is a partnership between over 200 uh, scientific and technical and medical publishers, plus four uh, agencies of the United Nations, plus a couple of US university libraries, uh, Pro and, and ProQuest and Microsoft. So quite an amazing uh, collection of uh, partnerships who have got together to, with the goal of reducing the knowledge gap between the Northern Hemisphere industrialised countries and the uh, developing world by providing affordable access to an enormous amount <coughs> of peer-reviewed scientific content from journals uh, uh, and books. During the last 15 years, over 8,000 institutions in developing countries have registered for access to this content from the publishing partnership. Um, what actually that means is that institutions in 71 of the world's poorest countries get free access to this content, while a further 44 countries, um, based on GNI per capita, pay $1,500 a year for a subscription, uh, which uh, amounts to an effective discount of over 99.9%. Um, within the Research for Life initiative, there are four programmes um, based around what has been felt to be the key subject areas uh, in demand in the developing world. The biggest and the oldest is Hinari uh, in biomedicine or health. There's also Agora for agriculture, Oari for environmental science, and Ardi, which effectively, uh, although labelled innovation and technology, represents the physical sciences and, and engineering. And as I say, we've going now for nearly 15 years, and uh, I think we felt... Uh, a couple of years ago, it was time to actually look and see what sort of impact uh, these programmes were having. Um, and in thinking about this, I, I think we were quite mindful of a topic that's sort of been discussed a little bit this morning by inference, and which was, I think, neatly summed up in an article in Scholarly Kitchen by Phil Davis that said, statistics and storytelling, why we need them both in science. And our feeling was that if we were going to look at uh, measuring the impact of the Research for Life programmes, it would be good to have some statistical evidence of impact, but uh, in order to get that feeling of understanding and appreciation of the benefits, we also needed to do some storytelling. Um, and if we take the storytelling first, um, we commissioned a series of case studies as a, a via running a competition where we asked people to uh, tell us the, their stories of how access to this information has made a positive impact on their work and their life and their community. Um, and we uh, did this in two ways. We first of all asked the end users to uh, talk to us and then a couple of years later we asked the uh, key intermediaries in actually getting this information out, the librarians in the developing world, to tell us a bit about their experiences too. So the first set of case studies um, was with researchers and practitioners, and I will say now that this is available as an online booklet, and there'll be a link later on. Um, 
we got a lot of very useful and interesting case studies. We found out how a doctor in Ethiopia was able to successfully treat a patient with a rare and serious condition. We found out how a researcher in Burkina Faso was able to develop better and more informed scientific writing skills. And his example was, I think, pretty typical. Um, uh, before his library made the Research for Life content available, he had been doing a lot of research into uh, tomato blight in his country. Uh, he'd submitted articles over and over again to international journals only for them to be rejected because his most recent reference was over 10 years old. Um, when he finally got access to the Research for Life content through Agora, uh, he was amazed to discover that all the work he'd been doing had been done before. Um, but it did at least mean that after that he was able to actually as it were, stand upon the shoulders of those giants and produce stuff that was much more uh, relevant and much more publishable. Uh, the Research for Life programmes, once again, have enabled a Nepalese paediatrician to uh, engage in a lot of life-saving treatment for diarrheal diseases and uh, also in the physician area. Uh, a, a, a guy in uh, Zambia has been able to massively improve the lives of uh, HIV-infected children while a midwife in Zimbabwe has been able to make significant inroads and reduce maternal and neonatal mortality rates. So you can see lots of examples of how practically in the field access to this content has saved lives as it had improved the human uh, condition. Nothing about citations, nothing about download levels, just practical stories about how this has positively benefited people. But not only at the uh, practical ground level uh, area. It's also, for example, allowed a Sudanese policy maker to introduce evidence-based policy development, which uh, was designed to improve the Sudanese people's health in the, in, in the long term. So it's at the strategic level as well as at the uh, practical level. And finally, here's an Ethiopian physiotherapist who was able to find better ways to treat patients and, 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 and teach his students. And there's a video uh, 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 of that giving more details, which once again, when you get the uh, slides on the website, you can click and, and, and see his personal testimony. Um, we also then, a couple of years later, uh, did a similar exercise, a competition uh, for librarians to give us their examples of, of how they'd managed to leverage the publisher content, and we published a series of case studies which, given how much of what the library community does is very much, as it were, under the radar. You see the benefits, but you can't see all the paddling that goes on to make it happen, and we called it unsung heroes stories from the library. And there were just lots and lots of really impressive examples. Here's a Ugandan agricultural librarian who's actually managed to boost usage and output. Here's a Kenyan librarian who's actually spread usage across 10 campuses and, and, and made it very clear that the library is research's digital backbone that had not been appreciated before. Here's another Ugandan health librarian who's actually uh, utilised the access to this content and developed a really powerful training infrastructure in information literacy and use at Ugandan universities. And here's another Kenyan librarian uh, who's become an expert on uh, information technology and electronic data resources and has done a lot of practical work collaborating with the medical staff in her institution to improve the way they treat their patients. And if you're on, once you see these uh, slides again, there's a video here that will give a day in her life and, and show the sort of benefits that have accrued. Uh, crossing continents, here's a really tech-savvy Honduran medical librarian who's actually resolved a lot of security issues with access to this content and uh, created a one-stop virtual medical library for uh, for his uh, patrons. Uh, uh, one of the early adopters in Nigeria has actually managed to take the Hinari content and use that to really transform the actual medical and nursing curricula within uh, her institution, uh, which I think is uh, an important thing to do. And finally, another Ugandan uh, librarian whose introduction of Research for Life at, at his Makerere University has seen a huge rise in research productivity. So lots of positive examples here of how uh, access to this content has made an impact both at the end user level but also how it's actually transformed the way in which librarians are able to operate within uh, the developing world. Now, if you remember, I said stories and statistics. 
Um, having conducted these um, case studies, we felt that we ought to now address the other issue of can we actually demonstrate impact of these, of these four programmes statistically. Um, and our first uh, instinct was to say, right, let's do a bibliometric analysis. This was our plan A. And we actually got together a, a group of people and we had this proposal, which was that we would do a comparative study. We would first of all identify institutions who'd been registered for HINARI, uh, the medical uh, programme, at least four years ago and had had significant use of its content. We'd then look at their research output in the last 15 years and we'd measure whether since the introduction of access to Hinari a number of things had happened. We'd look to see if there was a significant increase in the production of published research articles. We'd look to see if there was a significant increase in the number of cited references in those articles. We'd look to see if those reference lists included more citations to Hinari journals. And given the experience of the guy from Burkina Faso, we'd look to see if the median age of article references had decreased. And having done that, we would then take a couple of control uh, universes. Uh, we'd first of all look for some institutions who'd only registered for Hinari in the last 12 months. And then we'd look for a group of institutions who'd never registered for Hinari and had no formal institution access to the Hinari journals by any other means. And we'd gather that same data and then compare and contrast. However, we did actually not go ahead with this particular bibliometric approach because after extensive research and consultation we came to the reluctant conclusion that any such analysis uh, wouldn't be capable of isolating the impact of access to Hinari from quite a number of other confounding variables. For example, we found that there's no data available for developing country research producing institutions that would tell us anything about changes in the number of biomedical researchers at those institutions or changes in the level of funding for research. So you could have a huge increase in the things that we were trying to measure or a huge decrease that had nothing to do with uh, access to Hinari or non-access to Hinari. We also reluctantly concluded that we couldn't easily establish whether institutions who nominally didn't have access to the Hinari journals via Hinari might have similar access via uh, other means. And Given uh, the uh, issue of the guy in Burkina Faso who couldn't get his stuff published um, when he had references that were older than 10 years old, we felt that the idea of seeing if the median article reference age had changed over the years just wouldn't be viable because there wouldn't be enough stuff from the before to uh, make that worthwhile either. So we reluctantly uh, concluded that a bibliometric analysis with the data that we could gather together wasn't actually going to be viable and we sort of thought well is there an alternative you know we didn't want to give up on the idea of a statistical measure of impact totally and we wondered whether there might perhaps be an alternative statistical way of measuring impact other than bibliometrics and at that point I cast my mind back to a speaker who spoke at the um, STM conference a few years ago who cited a guy um, Professor Raymond Wolfinger from the University of California, Berkeley, who said, who declared that the plural of anecdote is data. And that made me think, well, you know, perhaps if we had enough case studies, we could have data. And so we decided that we would actually attempt to develop a statistical measure of uh, the impact of the Research for Life programmes through a user survey that would give us lots of, uh, uh, lots of response. Um, because it's the largest and the uh, uh, biggest of the programmes, uh, we decided that we would do this for uh, Hinari, the health one. And the survey that we conducted was published last year. Uh, once again, it's available online and there'll be a link at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, we asked quite a lot of questions, uh, most of which I don't have the time to uh, go into now. So I'd just like to concentrate on a couple of the questions that give some idea, uh, some feedback in terms of the nature of the impact that access to these programmes has had on the target community. Um, we uh, 
got a th- just over a thousand respondents, with a significant number of them from both the researcher community and the physician community, which was good. We wanted to actually be able to do an analysis that would show what effect it had had on researchers, what effect access had had on physicians. Um, we asked the researchers to tell us, give us some idea of what effect having access to the to previous research via Hinari had had on them and we got a lot of responses. If you look at the graph here uh, what you mainly need to know is that blue is good uh, and red is bad and that isn't a political statement I'm afraid that's just the way it went. Um, uh, and a lot of things here um, it helped them improve their article, scientific article writing skills it advanced their career improved the content of their teaching helped them conduct their own research did research that enhanced the life quality of people in their country uh, deliver more effective training back to David's uh, uh, measuring of, of, of teaching effectiveness for example here uh, succeeded in getting their own research papers published, very important uh, developing a productive relationship with the institutional library and so on and so forth so there's a whole catalogue here of positive impacts that having research access via Hinari had uh, resulted in uh, We asked physicians a similar question, what's been the effect of having access to previous research for Hinari? And the focus here was very much on um, developing medical practices that are more effective, saved lives, enhanced the quality of lives of patients, developed more accurate clinical diagnosis, better treatment, uh, and and so on and so forth. And once again, you can see the predominance of the the blue colour there, Uh, 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 I think, some very rewarding feedback to be able to bring back to the uh, publishers whose uh, generosity and far-sightedness has enabled all this content to be uh, made available. Uh, There were a lot of positive testimonials in the free-form questions, a lot of positive testimonials to the value of the Hinari programme. I won't read through these now, as I uh, I say, I only have 25 minutes, but it was very reassuring to see... uh, Uh, these things. Um, Those are the URLs, you won't have time to jot them down now but once again if you uh, access the uh, presentation from the website when it goes up it's it's all there for the uh, for the taking. And so we move from increasing impact of published content in the developing world to something altogether different um, which is increasing the impact and utility of our published scientific content within the patient and carer uh, community. And this is a very, very different uh, scenario. Um, And I'm going to talk about a a project uh, initiative uh, which is uh, a a joint initiative between STM and the Association of American Publishers Professional and Scholarly Publications Division, AAPPSP. or patient inform. Um, it's a collaboration uh, that involves uh, something just over 20 of the major medical publishers. In fact, I think pretty well all the major medical publishers here, uh, and almost uh, 20 what we in the UK would call medical uh, research charities, what in America tend to be called voluntary health organisations. Um, and they ver- that there's a really wide range here from the real major big American Cancer Society, American Diabetes Association, through to some quite small, very specialist uh, uh, medical charities dealing with some fairly uh, rare diseases. And, and basically, the, the challenge here is, is nicely expressed, I think, in this particular uh, quote from a carer that said, I'm educated to degree level but my degree is in geography. Most research articles that relate to my son's condition are couched in such detailed specialist scientific jargon and they presuppose such an immense knowledge of biology, biochemistry, genetics, pharmacology, etc. They might as well be written in in, in Esperanto. And even for any articles that are marginally more comprehensible, it's still just about impossible for me to know which of the many hundreds that appear represent significant advances in knowledge or significant steps in the quest for a treatment or cure. Now, that's the problem. Now, a couple of years ago or so, uh, JISC uh, developed a project called Patients Participate, and in the report that came out of that, um, they specifically 
said that publishing a lay summary alongside every research article could be the answer to assisting in the wider understanding uh, of health-related information, particularly uh, by patients and carers. And they had two suggestions as to ways in which this might be achieved. Now, there'll be a, a sort of spurt of recognition here from uh, Charlie when I say that the first recommendation was that each researcher produces uh, a summary for each pu paper they publish, a lay summary with training provided by their institutions to help them develop the communication skills necessary to share these findings with a lay audience. But basically it was a lay summary for each paper. The other recommendation was that we should encourage uh, the role of medical research charities in providing patients and the public with information about the research they fund. And it's this second uh, recommendation that Patient Inform is designed to facilitate and encourage. So what Patient Inform does, it makes it easier for these medical research charities to keep up to date with the latest research in their field by giving them unlimited access to around a thousand subscription-based journals from Patient Inform participants participating publishers. But it also provides a mechanism whereby these the, the lay summaries that the medical research charities can actually distill from having access to these articles, it provides a mechanism whereby these articles can be linked to the full text uh, of the lay summaries. That means that patients and can care carers can get um, an intelligible summary of the most significant, important latest research, but if they want to, they can actually click and go to the article on which that lay summary is based to print it out and take it to their physician uh, as part of the dialogue between themselves and, 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 and the people who are doing, giving them medical treatment. So I think what is important about this is that it's not sufficient, I don't think, just to have a lay summary for every article. If you think back to that carer's dilemma, it was also knowing which of the thousands and thousands and thousands of articles coming out on your particular medical condition are the ones that, that might have practical implications for you as a patient or a carer rather than ones that are like sort of work in progress. And bringing in the medical charities here allows the medical charities who have the expertise to sort of scan, scan through the literature and say, here are the dozen or so papers published this year in our medical discipline that are really important uh, and really significant for patients. Just a little bit of example of how it works. Here's the Lupus uh, Foundation of America and this is their uh, patient info, this is their lupus research page and they have a little explanation here about how this actually works and how patient inform works. Uh, and then you can go in as a patient or carer, uh, there's a lot of aspects of lupus but if you decide that it's that particular topic you're interested in, that will take you to a list of their lay summaries click on the one that you'd like to know more about and there is this sort of structured summary saying what's the topic, what did the researchers hope to learn, what was studied, exactly the sort of stuff that Charlie was talking about earlier on in terms of answering specific questions. And here are the, the, the questions, what's the topic, what do we hope to learn, how was the study conducted, what did the researchers find, what were the limitations of the study and critically what do the results mean uh, for you. And you can see why that is such a critical question for an awful lot of people when you actually click through to see the uh, a typical uh, article. What do these results mean for you as a patient or carer? It, it, it can be really, really difficult to tell. Um, and I think that that question and the fact that the lay summaries answer it is it, interesting because when you actually look at the statistics, although a lot of articles are downloaded as a result of this, what we found when we've looked at the ratio of downloads of the lay summaries uh, compared to how many people actually click through to access the original article, it's only about 2%. Only about 2% of the, of the patients or carers who read those lay summaries really feel that they need to know more. And I think that's, that's very interesting. I think that um, there's a lot of feeling that says patients ought to be able to have access to all this sort of stuff. I think the real statement should be patients ought to have access to interpretation of this sort of stuff because that really does seem to be what at least 98% of them want. 
So that's patient in form. That's my email address if you wanted to uh, email me and ask for the presentation before it goes up on the web, but I think it's going to be pretty quick and I'm happy to take questions either now or later on.